My authority mentioned, my name is Patrick Hoen. I joined here two and a half months ago, but nevertheless, I was already a user also here for quite a couple of years and as part of my research since 2018, I'm working with OpenFOAM and that mostly from a developer perspective and less from a user perspective. And there I have gained quite some insights which I would like to share with you today. Also, if you are just starting, maybe you learn a bit more and you get a good jump start, but I hope also for others that they get some more ideas. With that, I would like to move over to the agenda. At first, I motivate a little bit why we do debugging. The second part is the requirements. I mostly talk about what all we need to do for the installation so that we can look at the different things which I want to show you. In the tool section, there I show which different debugging tools are there and which I want to show to you today. This part is a bit split, or the whole talk is a little bit split into a terminal part. And we also have two GUI, two GUIs, Visual Studio Code and Qt Creator, which is maybe for the user a bit more comfortable and also has some use cases, of course, if one has more tricky things to debug. And at the end, I give some further reading and reference. So I think any developer knows it. The code is not working as one thought. So one somehow needs to understand it. And especially OpenFOAM, which is a C++ based code. We cannot just like Python do a live debugging break in between. It's not that easy. That's why they have a bit more critical to fix runtime errors and also to study that compiled code and also influence how it is running is more complicated compared to a simple Python script. That's why um, I'd show you today a few ways how to do it. Now, before I go deeper, I would like to mention that when it comes here for open form, there is not C1 open form like when we, for example, have Microsoft Office. Open form is an open source project and actually there are three different flavors. There's a foundation one, there is a or .org version called, the ESI version, .com version, named as well, and there's a form extent. And what I will show you today is mostly based on form extent in version 4.1, but of course, with some modifications should also work with the others. If you find something which is not working, then please come back to me and so I can all so update the slides and yeah, hopefully next time we can give a bit more complete slides. Now, the important thing, if you look from a developer perspective and not from a user perspective, as a developer, it's always good to have an own copy of the source code. Whereas as a user, if we, for example, use a cluster, we just load the respective module and then we are good to go. But as a developer, potentially, if we use some custom code, we also need to change some files of the core code of from extent. For example, I know a, an add-on called solids for foam for fluid structure interaction that actually needed for successful compilation sets two, three files are updated in from extent. So in that case, we really need the source code. And here on the next few slides, I show you based on the open form wiki um, description, how one, would, how one would compile from extent 4.1 at Ubuntu 2.2004 LTS. 
One of course needs to install some packages beforehand. Then one creates a folder and clones a code from the upstream search repository. And then one needs to do some modifications. One thing which one needs to remember when it comes here for open form, the code is partially not the most modern one. So depending on which form extent or open form version one is trying to compile, it might not or it is likely that it is not running with the latest GCC version. For form extent 4.1, it is confirmed, and I also tested it, that it works with GCC 7, and that's why also we set it here in the press um, settings file, so that this is always used when something of this from extent 4.1 is compact. One also need to adjust it in some other, in the WMake rules files, but not much more about that. Generally, when you install more than one version, it's advisable to define such a liars. Then you don't need to type set long source and the whole bash rc. But you can just type, for example, here what I defined for form extent 4.1, just short fe41. And we will also need a debug version. So I also defined the respective one for the debug version that I could easily switch between the two. And then we are pretty much set. We can just go again to our first folder and to be sure when I just put here again that we saw the bash rc file so that all the environmental variables are set correctly. Then with RW make all WMake first install, we will get the optimized version. This is what you would generally use for simulation and what is probably also installed in the cluster. But when we want to do debugging, we also need uh, the debug version. And this is compiled now with the command here in line four. Then for the tools I want to use, there are three more which we need to install. This is wall print for memory checking, QT creator and code, this is Visual Studio code in order to also have some graphical user interfaces to integrate development environments. So that, yeah, things are maybe more easy to see and maybe also to work with. There's another tool GDBOF, what it is exactly, I will talk more about later and what my opinion of it is. But this is something we need to manually install. So basically, we also just need to compile it, at first clone the code from GitLab and then compile it. In which folder you compile it is actually Pretty random, I just chose now the form folder. So with that, I would then like to go to the first way of how I would do debugging. That's also how I did it many times. Um, I just copied here some code from, I think, the piece of form solver. And it's just that we modify the code that we modify the code um, and add their printouts to the standard output. In open form, there's also the info um, stream defined, and that's what's used here. And then we can just put more info statements in our code, and by that, for example, see at which point the code stops working and maybe also output variables, like here, for example, the time name. But, and that's a very simple way of doing things, but it has a few downsides. Of course, we cannot really influence how the code is executed. 
Every time we want to put a new, we want to get more information, we need to add another line of code and recompile it. And when we have finally successfully done our debugging, then we also need to clean the code again because we don't want to pollute our log files that much. Now, there should be a better way of doing it. Also, open form has there some of those info statements which we can switch on and off, which we can do using debug switches. Debug switches we can define in the control dict for a case and also then give different debug levels so define also how verbose it is. So statements are defined for most classes and the good thing is that built in and we don't need to do any recompilation unlike what we had before. If one wants to see all the active debug switches and also other switches, there are two different commands and how to use them. At the top I put how it is for the .org and the .com version and the bottom how one does it for the form extent version. Now, how does it look like in real life? Here I just put some output from a console window and just want to show you what the difference is. And you think I'm looking here at the Pits Daily tutorial and I'm running one the scalar transport form with the debug switches enabled and without and here I just briefly show what happens when we don't put it. Then in the time step we just get the standard output and with those debug switches turned on we see quite a bit more. We see which functions are called and for example three times here the update coef function at the end the evaluate function and with that we could already maybe get some hint at which point of the code the code has an error and just we have a segmentation fault or something that could just stop working. So that is already an improvement compared to what we had just before. However, we can still not study the runtime behavior, look at variables during runtime, continue the code. All of that is not possible. And for that, we use a tool called GDB, the GNU debugger, which allows us to do those things. One, we can, I will show you also in the command line how it looks like GDB and then also how to use it from the, from Visual Studio Code and from Qt Creator. Two things are, however, a downside compared to what we did before. As you already have seen, we had to compile the debug version, so we need more disk space and also when we use those runtime debugging tools, the execution time is a lot slower, so generally you would just do it if you really want to debug something and not for a productive simulation run. If you have your made your own solver, then it's important to also modify your for your own solver the make options file, add here the GDB and the full debug so that the solver also uses that is compiled in the debug version. There are two more tools which I would like to introduce. One is a GDB OF, which is a set of macros which are supposed to make debugging with GDB a little bit simpler by defining some additional commands. Uh, it should also allow to dump data at runtime and expect data structures more easily. However, despite there was even a scientific paper written about it, um, it's currently maintained and fairly buggy. That's why I don't use it in the hands-on session. 
but if someone is interested in picking it up, maybe also developing, maybe it will be useful some, at some point again. And the last tool, which I already a bit mentioned, is Volcrint when we, when it came for installation that we can use for memory debugging, memory detection, proof and profiling as well. But in this talk, I won't talk about the profiling because it would be just out of the scope to at least time-wise. Then I probably could not talk half an hour, but maybe one, two hours. With that, um, I, we have the two IDEs. We have Visual Studio Code, which is multi-platform. And I also want to mention that the proprietary version, there's also an open source version, which does not have telemetry, but for that, the installation of the C++ tools um, is a bit more manual. That is why also I use here Visual Studio Code and also installed it as a snap package. If it's not working, then potentially I trust also the developers are then able to use custom package repositories and also make that work. But just in the slides for easy for easiness, I put the snap package. And with that, we can use many different languages. C++ is, of course, most important for us since that is what OpenFORM is coded in. And it has also the standard features you would expect. Syntax highlighting, code completion, also integration of revision management systems like Git or Subversion, and has also a graphical debugger. There, the features of Qt Creator are fairly similar. The only difference is it's based on and integrated in the Qt framework, which is a multi-platform C++ framework for general app, for developing general applications, whereas Visual Studio Code is based on Electron, in the Electron framework, so JavaScript. But Apart from that, feature-wise, I think they are fairly similar, and I will also show you both. Now, for the hands-on session, I will use the PITS daily tutorial, and that I'm running with the Scalar Transport form. And for that also, um, we will have a bit a modified version for which the source code I will provide provide because, of course, that built-in version should not have memory flaws or issues. So if you want to see those, then of course we need to add those flaws. It should not be in the productive code, of course. With that, here I would briefly move over to the command line and also show you briefly how the things are working. Here I have now two different terminal windows also sent for later purposes. On the left we have our, I have the code of, we can just then later have a look at the code where we have all the flaws and on the right hand side we have the simulation case, and then we can also just start it with the, uh, with the built-in version. Scalar transport foam. And what is, comes in pretty handy, I have put all the, all the different shortcuts and commands in tables where we will go through after I showed you a little bit around again. So, if you don't understand something completely right now, don't be scared. It's Control X, Control A. I can also see the code and go through it. Then, if you want to now go through the code and see how it works, then it is pretty, then it's important that we also can define, for example, breakpoints and tell the 
debugger to stop the code then at a certain line so that we can inspect the code or try also to understand what is actually going on. So, for example, if I would now define a break, a breakpoint, I can either use the short for this is B, and with that I could, for example, put a breakpoint at line 55, which we now also see up here shown. Now, nothing has happened when it comes there for the code yet, since maybe we also put one directly at the beginning of the main function. And nothing has happened in terms of execution yet because we did not run the code. Just when we now type run, that we don't need right now, then the code is actually executed and we also see that we are now, the, the debugger stopped now in the line where I told him in line 38. Now, we could continue to run the code, but that for that we can use C. Then it would just continue till set breakpoint. Um, if now the text interface up there is missing with Control L, we can just refresh it so we see where we are. Uh, with next, then we can just move over to the next line. Uh, with step, we could also then go into functions that we see that, that it's just, we don't see only the output of the function, but also how the debugger goes through the different functions. And one thing which is maybe interesting, I would now put another, I would now put another breakpoint in line 57 because there is something I would like to show you. If we now continue to get there, maybe one more time, then you also have the possibility to print what is inside those variables. T that is a pointer, that's why we need a star in front of it. With V underscore, we get the first value. But it's also possible to, T is a, the temperature field. We can also get there more. So we could also say maybe from the second to the 15th, those values we want to see. Ah. And of course, I need to put there. Mr. the V. For 2 to 5, we get those values. And with that, we get there a first idea what we can do. With that, I would like to go over to the slides again. I quit the debugger here. And here, quite a few, a few of those commands which I have shown you are here in the slide. Help is maybe for the start important to also get the description of the different commands and which all commands are there. This list just like <clears throat> with cut in the terminal, we can also see different lines. We can also see it for certain files, actually. The run command I was showing you, the C command. Just to mention here, if there are something in rectangular brackets, then that letter or those letters are the short command, but the long one also works. This was here what I showed you about the text user interface. What is also interesting to see um, if several functions are calling each other in a sort of st in a, the call stack, then we can see that with a backtrace and with frame and go to a certain layer in the, back, in the stack tray. It's also possible to have their conditional breakpoints, which I did not show. We can also have watch points where which allow us to 
um, stop when a certain condition is met. And here's the step commands I was showing you. The info, that is maybe still nice to see. And if you want to go to one layer above, that we can do with finish. And it's also even possible to call open form inside functions from the debugger. And this bit, we go out just as I showed you. For the ball print part, as I mentioned, there I use some modified code, which I provide you. Then that file, you will find it then on the website if possible, otherwise I post you a link. And then we need to modify the MyScaler transport with a different, to introduce a different mistakes. For example, if we now would do here, the mistake is that we have the allocated the memory, but we did not free it. If we would now do the wall print task with the simple solver, it will take a bit of time. As I said, it goes slower. Then we will see that there are no errors, basically, because the standard solver is going OK. But when we will then run it with our modified solver, then we will have the errors in the output then check dot text file. I also put you a few more common mistakes from a tutorial from the Open Form Workshop, just to give you an idea what different things could go wrong and how it said that you also have a sample to then look at it, how it looks in all grid with the output. We have dynamically, dynamically allocated memory, which is not deleted, uh, array, and also just um, pointers. We have uninitialized variables. We have segmentation faults because of out of bound and dereference of a null pointer and also using memory after it was freed. So quite a few things to play with. I will just show you in this talk the first thing, but later on you will have the code. You can feel free to then also look at others. It's a other example. Just I think since time is a bit short, I would now let this run and come back to this in a second again and move on here. Um, when we use then Visual Studio Code, there, of course, we also need to set up the environment again. I put here block mesh because I don't know if the key or could be also for other tutorials. Another mesh generator, here we use block mesh and then in that folder, we just start with code dot the Visual Studio code in that folder. Um, I also put there the internal files or the JSON files which I needed to run it with those it was running with me. This, and also I put here some explanation if you later on want to try it on your own. With that, I hope yeah, it is done. We can have a quick look here at the mem check and we see error summary, there is no single error, which is good and this is also what we expected. Then we use the unmodified code without any issues. Here, however, we have the, some fault with wmake, we can just quickly recompile it. Just to be sure that the code I just have shown you is actually also having the fault. And once that is completed, we can just run that here while I, while I already 
can show you a little bit around Visual Studio Code. For that, I open now another terminal and just do code dot in here. And then Visual Studio Code should show up. It actually does, just not with the screen I anticipated. Ask if it trusts it. Certainly I trust my... Ah, that is in the wrong folder. Sorry. Of course I need to do it here, where I have my first code. Then it also opens with the code. So basically, here we see exactly the same what we also saw in the terminal editor. And it gives us also, here we have our code, here we see also different files. You can just change by double clicking. I think that's fairly standard. Here with the run build task, we can compile the code since it's already compiled, we just did it, we don't need it. And then, if we go here with the OF debug, which I pre-configured, um, we can also start the debugging. And if we then look a bit at things, you will notice that if we look here at the terminal, it's basically what we saw also directly in the terminal. The debug console also allows us to command line, in the command line, execute, execute text commands. But what is different now? Here's the call stack. We have it permanently visible in a window. And what makes our life quite a bit easier is we don't need the print command anymore, but we can directly access the local variables. It takes now a tiny bit, simply because that's a bit larger the field. And that time, I would just like to go back here. No, okay, was not done yet. But it will be done in a second, because then I can just briefly show you um, how it looks like when there's a fault. And just the, yeah. And here you see now we have two errors, basically, and it also gives us a hint where the problem is, it tells us in my, trans, my scalar transport form in line 61, and this is what you see here also, where we initialized the variable and we did not properly delete it. So with that, we already would have a hint what we have done wrong. And this is basically what here for memory leak detection or the memory debugging, we get there some good hints. Now, um, what I showed you with stepping and continuing, all of that we also have up here, but this time in a nice graphical toolbar. And we can basically do exactly the same thing like in the terminal, simply also because internally GDB is again used. Um, at the back, but it is hidden here under some nice GUI. So I would now stop here the debugging for Visual, Visual Studio Code. Briefly move over to the slides and just show you a few more steps which would be needed. I won't go through them in detail now, just I put them all here so that once you want to do the things afterwards again, hopefully you have all the information you do need. Now for Qt Creator, when you do it for the first time, an additional step is needed. You also need to add the, all the include folders so that it, so that it also 
finds all the header files during debugging. And the instructions for that I put you here. Now I would just open here Qt Creator because the other parts I have already done. I also created the project and configured it. If you need some help, you find it in the slides. And if we now go here also to debug mode and start debugging, then you will see that basically it is fairly comparable to Visual Studio Code. This time we have the debug controls down here, our variable window here at the right, which loads this time a bit faster. We have our call stack, should be here. Here we have our breakpoints. And in general, the usability is fairly similar. But I just wanted to show you both so that if one, when one uses tools, it's always a matter of taste. And for that purpose, I believe it's good to at least show briefly two options. But there are, of course, more. Here, I also put you all the different slides to give you some idea when you are importing a project, what you need to modify, how it then looks like you saw that. Here is where I pasted all the different include folders, the build setup had to be modified, but all of that will be pre-done in the first tab, in the first tabball I'm providing to you. So I don't need to go here over the exact steps. With that, I would then slowly like to close my talk. Here I gave you quite a different set of references where you can do further reading. Um, two things I would still like to point out. Form Science also has some the repositories for unit testing and also continuous integration, if I remember correctly. That would be an advanced topic, which could be just the topic of another presentation here. And one thing which I did not explicitly say so far, it's also important, all we did here was on a local machine. But with Visual Studio Code, it's also possible to remote access an HPC cluster and via GWDG also provides us some instructions for that, which you find here in that link. And with that, I would like to close my talk. Thank you for attention and I'm very happy for any questions now. Thanks, Patrick, for your presentation. I was